Welcome back. This is the second video in the ARIMA chapter. What I like to do in this video is to talk about autoregressive and moving average processes. In the next video, we're going to bring these two together with all the differencing that we did in the previous video to define the ARIMA model. So let's begin with the AR1. AR stands for autoregressive. In order to build up a little bit of intuition on, on, on what's happening here, I thought I would review a couple of the models that we went over during the first week of class. Back in the first week of class, we talked about white noise models, random walk models, and random walk with drift models. I'm going to go over to my document camera, and let's just review what these things look like. In the case of white noise, what we have is some constant C, which is going to be the long-term mean. What we've observed, so this is my Y value that I'm observing, is basically just random noise. So these are meant to be equally spaced, but um, these errors would have a normal distribution centered at zero with a variance of sigma squared, and there is no nothing to explain. There, this is just completely random. What is a random walk? Well, in the case of a random walk, what we have is we're going to start out at zero, and you know, we can call this my y sub zero value. We have a recursive relationship here where the next value of y is just the previous value of y plus some you know, step in a random direction with a random size. Let's say that my first error turned out to be positive. This would be my y1 then. So I take my previous value of y and I add uh, some amount of random noise. So this would be my uh, first error. And this would be the observed value at time one. Okay, what happens at time period two? Well, at time period two, I start out where I was, and I take another hop of some uh, random amount. The distance right here would be the second error. Uh, what do I get for time period three? Well, I start out where I was, and I take a hop in some random direction, and this time maybe my error is negative, so I go down. And this would produce a random walk. So the point is, all I remember is where I'm at, and then once I, I know where I'm at, I take a, a hop in some random direction. By the way, this would be E3. Finally, let's talk about the random walk with a drift. This was random walk. Let's do random walk with a drift C equal to 1, say. And so the idea here would be uh, we start out, uh, you know, we could, could start out uh, at 0 plus c. And let's say that this is my c. So I start out here. Um, so my y naught plus c. And then what happens? Well, I take some random noise. And so just to be consistent with what I had up here, let's, say, let's take the same error that I had up here. So I would start at the c, and I would go up by whatever that random error is. So this distance is e1. Okay, what do I do next? Well, uh, my y2 is going to be um, wherever I was, so at y1, plus my c. So let's take a hop up of size c. And then I take another hop up of size e2. And that's going to put me up here. And then where do I go for 3? Well, remember my error was, was negative. Um, so I would start out here. I would go up by C, I would go up by C, then I would go down by whatever the error was, and maybe that puts me back about where I was. With the drift term, this C is going to um, give me a, a trend with my, with my time series. A first order autoregressive model, otherwise known as AR1, is as follows. So this looks a lot like my random walk with a drift with one difference. The difference is 
I don't start out at y t minus 1. I only start out at, at some constant phi times that. Think of this as a regression. So it looks a lot like a regression where I'm, I'm predicting y t from the values of y t minus 1 from the lag version of this. So c is like your intercept and phi is your slope. Let's look at specific values of phi. So if I were to set phi equal to zero, notice what I end up with. So this term goes away and I'm left with random noise. If I were to get rid of the constant, so let's say I've got no drift term, but I set my phi equal to one, I end up with just a basic random walk. If I have um, a non-zero c, but phi is equal to one, then I have the random walk with a drift. None of those are new uh, or all that interesting. What's going to be interesting is when we set phi between zero and one, because then we get something which I would characterize as being between white noise and a random walk. So it's white noise tends to be very jagged and bumpy. Random walks tend to be smoother, where this phi gives me a continuum between those two, between pure noise and a random walk. It's conceivable to have a negative phi, and so then the idea would be take wherever I was and, and go the other direction. And when you do that, you tend to get y t values that oscillate a bit. Those are not that interesting usually. You know, we're mostly interested in these situations that are between white noise and a random walk. We are going to be restricting our phi values to be between minus 1 and positive 1 because that guarantees that we have a stationary process. I'm not going to prove that, but that's what you would get in a more advanced class, that when you have phi's between these values, you get stationarity. When we do ARIMA models, especially with maximum likelihood estimation, we're also going to assume something more with the errors, and that is that they're normal. Earlier we were just assuming that they were, could be any random variable, as long as they're uncorrelated. Now we're going to assume normal, independent, uh, random, random variables for these EITs. We're going to write that as NID, which stands for Normal Independently Distributed Observations. Back in the first week of class, we derived some of the key properties of these three distributions. So the key properties back then were the means and the variances. I'm going to give a similar result here. Theorem, the long-term mean and variance as well as the autocorrelation functions are given as follows. Let me talk through uh, where the, at least the first one comes from. Uh, y t is equal to some constant plus phi times y t minus 1 plus my, uh, I'll call it epsilon. I think from the previous page I was calling it ease. I, I always get them mixed up. It, it doesn't matter. Let's go find the mean of this. So the expected value of yt is equal to the expected value of this whole thing. So maybe I'll, I'll write it out. So c plus v y t minus 1 plus epsilon t. And so we can distribute this. This is equal to the, the expected value of a constant is just the constant. Here we have a constant times something. So we have plus phi. I can bring that out of the expected value uh, y t minus 1. And then I have the expected value of epsilon t. If you grant me stationarity, then this is equal to mu. So mean of y t is just the long term mean, which we'll call mu. Uh, what is the mean of y t minus 1? Well, if, the, if we have stationarity, the mean doesn't change. And this is also equal to mu. What is this last term? Well, this last term is 0 because we've assumed that these are um, random variables with mean 0. So now I have an equation. Let me just write out that equation. Mu is equal to c plus v times mu. And I can just go solve this thing for mu. 
So I'm going to bring mu, th this term over to the other side, and we end up with, I'll just say I'm going to bring it over there, I end up with mu times 1 minus v is equal to c. So mu is equal to c all over 1 minus v. If you don't want to grant me the stationarity part, I'm going to just sketch through uh, a different way to get to this, which, um, which doesn't require assuming the stationarity. So let's just, uh, you know, y sub t again is c plus v times y t minus 1 plus my air at time t. Well, this is just the same as c plus v, but what is this thing? What is y t minus 1? Well, that's really just, this is going to be c plus v times y t minus 2 plus epsilon t minus 1 plus epsilon t. So this whole thing is equal to what I put in brackets right here. So let's just put a little arrow sign. What we can then do is collect the term. So I can distribute this and we end up with c times 1 plus v. And then what do we have here? We have v squared times y t minus 2, it's like t minus 2 there, plus v times epsilon t minus 1 plus epsilon t. What we're going to do is write out what is this thing. Let me just insert what this is. This is just c plus v y t minus 3 plus epsilon t minus 2. And if you keep doing this, what you end up with is the following expression plus the sum uh, i is equal to 0 to t minus 1 uh, phi to the i epsilon t minus i. So I had to do a little bit of work. If, if you um, I, I, what I would do is write out a couple more of these and you'll start to see this pattern. Now if I take the expected value of this, what I, um, what I end up with is I have a constant here. This is another constant. All of these go to zero. So the epsilon, the expected values of these epsilons are all zero. So this term will be zero. Now as t goes to infinity, phi to the t this goes to zero. So phi to the t goes to zero as long as phi is uh, less than one. So that guarantees that this is going to go to zero. And then what do I have here? Well, I have c. This is a ge geometric series. So this would be one minus phi to the t all over one minus phi but this is going to go to zero as my uh, t goes to infinity. So as t gets really big, that goes to zero. So let's just cross that out. And you end up with c all over 1 minus v plus zero plus zero. All right. And so that's how we, um, we can, one way to show this. And notice what happens when uh, phi is equal to 1. If phi were equal to 1, this would blow up. The mean would blow up. It would be c over 0, which is infinity. And so that's why we're going to constrain phi's to be less than 1, so that this doesn't blow up. The autocorrelation function is just given by phi to the k. The correlation between t and, and an observation k periods away is phi to the k. So what's really important to notice about this is that it, it's going to decrease geometrically as k increases. So that's assuming phi is positive, but um, if, if phi were negative, it would still go to zero as k increases. The reason this is important is that 
one of the first things that we'll do when we're building one of these ARIMA models is to look at an ACF. And if the ACF uh, decreases geometrically, so if my ACF looks something like this, here's my, uh, as a function of k, if the autocorrelation function sort of declines like this, that's a, that's a hint that you have an AR1 process going on. Well, let's go look at a mathematical example now to see how this works. I, I, the first thing I've done is I've, I've generated 100 errors from a normal 0, 1. Just, then this make AR function takes one argument, which is phi, and then what it returns is this time series object y. And so you can see how I'm computing these y values recursively following the formula for an AR1 process. First, let's go look at an autocorrelation. And so what I told you earlier is that we expect the ACF to de decrease geometrically, and so that's exactly what we, uh, what we have in this ACF. So this is very typical for an AR process. So whenever you see an ACF that looks like this, that's a signal that an AR, AR1 would be a, a reasonable model, could be a reasonable model. Now what I'd like to do is to generate a couple AR1 processes using different values of phi. So the first value of phi that I'm going to choose is 0.01. Now, 0 0.01 is very close to zero, and so the resulting time series should look a lot like white noise. And so that's exactly what we see up here. Now I'm going to generate one with uh, 0.5, and so this is really halfway in between a random walk and white noise. And so what you'll see with this time series is it's less jagged. You don't see quite as many bumps as you had with white noise. Well, let's go to the other extreme. I'm going to choose a phi of 0.99, and now what we see is something that, you know, I couldn't tell this from a random walk. So we're giving 99% of the weight uh, to the previous value. So we're almost exactly starting out at the previous value, and then adding a little bit of, of random noise to that. We can generalize the AR1 process to the ARP process. In this class, P is always going to be used to indicate the order of an autoregressive process. Let's start with an AR2 process. So the idea here is that Y sub T could be some constant plus some uh, constant times the previous value plus some constant times two values uh, ago. And that's, um, that's going to be our AR2 process. So my current value of y is a function of both the previous value of y and the one before that. We're going to have various constraints to guarantee stationarity. The constraints get more complicated as we increase the order. We don't have to stop with an AR2 process. Here's the general ARP where my current Y value is determined from the previous P Y values. The stationarity constraints get even more complicated. I'm not going to attempt to, to state them here. Just, just realize that R will impose those stationarity constraints whenever we use AR models in their uh, forecast library. I'd like to now talk about the backshift notation. So the idea with backshift is we want to move all of our y's to the left-hand side of the equation, and we want all the errors and the constant on the right-hand side. Let's go start with an AR2 model. So let's remember, this is an AR2 model. My yt is just some c plus v1 times y t minus 1 plus v2 times y t minus 2 plus epsilon 2. So I want to move these two terms over to the other side of the equation. So this becomes y t minus 
B1Y T minus 1 minus B2Y T minus 2 is just C plus my uh, epsilon. That should be epsilon T. Epsilon T. We can think of this as my back shift operator times yt, and we can think of this as my back shift operator twice, so we can write that as b squared yt. I can factor out the yt's, so let's go do that. We usually put that on the right hand side, so this is going to be 1 minus e1 times my back shift operator. This is going to be minus e2 times my back shift operator squared, and all this is multiplied by yt. This is equal to c plus epsilon t. So this is just an alternate way of writing the AR2 model. Here's how you do this for the ARP model. We'll be using maximum likelihood to estimate these. R also offers a nonlinear least squares estimation routine. Both are, are completely uh, valid. How do we compute future forecasts? Well, almost like regression. The only thing that's slightly messy here is that if you haven't observed one of these y's, you're going to use the forecast value. So, so we're, we're going to compute these sequentially. So we'll, we'll first find t plus 1, where we actually know all of the observed y values. How do we get to t plus 2? Well, we're going to insert the forecast value for y t plus 1 uh, because we haven't observed the real y t plus 1. So that's how we compute our forecast. More on that in a future lecture. I'd like to talk about one more diagnostic tool that we're going to have. That diagnostic tool is the partial autocorrelation function. Let's assume for now that I have an AR1 model. So remember what an AR1 model is. Yt is just some constant plus v, yt minus 1, plus my epsilon t. So y sub t is really just a function of y t minus 1, nothing else. So any observation prior to that could enter recursively, as, as we had back um, in, in this derivation that I was showing. But really, all we need to know is the y t minus 1 value to get to y t. I don't need any of the other values, because all of that information is contained in this y t term. Remember what I said about AR1 models. What I told you was that the autocorrelation function is just going to be phi to however many periods back. So the correlation between yt and yt minus 1 is going to be the same as yt minus 1 and yt minus 2. In both cases, it's phi to the 1 power. However, notice that the, the autocorrelation between yt and yt minus 2 is going to be phi squared. So where is that coming from? It's coming from this expression that I gave you two slides ago. What I'm trying to say with this is there, there appears to be a correlation between yt minus 2 and yt, even though yt minus 2 doesn't have any direct effect on yt. So the way we can avoid this problem is to compute a partial correlation. So that's like we control for all the lags in between. In my little example up here, if I were to control for the value of y t minus 1, then I wouldn't see a correlation between y t minus 2 and y t. The diagnostic plot that gives this to us is the PACF, or par partial autocorrelation function. There's a really nice function in R called TS display, and when we use that, we get both the ACF and the PACF, as well as the time plot. We're going to be using the TS display function whenever we start analyzing a data set. Let's go back to that time series where I had a fee of 0.95. We see this geometrically declining ACF. But when we look at the PACF, 
this is showing us that the, the only significant autocorrelation is the first one. You know, all of these other values are just occurring because of their relationships with the, the lags in between. All right, so what's, um, what, what this is going to tell us is that when we look at our PAC, PACF, in a case like this where we only have one significant autocorrelation, we should probably try an AR1 model. If the first two PACF values were significant, then I would be looking at an AR2 model. Now, if you get a more complicated one, we're going to need to try something else. But that's the way to use this plot. So it's summarized very clearly in that bullet item. So that's really important to, to know how to use this diagnostic.